Okay, good. Thank you everyone for coming. And uh, today we are going to see a chip and you know, you are worried about 5-6 transistor circuit and you are occupying the entire uh, 100G or whatever, right? And we, that's the chip that I am going to show you which we are simulating is about what? 100K plus transistors and this is all analog type of, uh, you know, circuit. So, we are able to do that. So, it is not such a big deal, alright? So, let us with that uh, introduction, let us get started. So, what we will do is the following. We will uh, first about first uh, 30 to 40 minutes, I will show you a ADC, you know, a uh, like a professional A to D converter that, uh, that I wanted to show you how you do it, you know. Let us say you decide to take up a job in one of the um, semiconductor companies and everyone knows, right, how important semiconductor field is now with what is going on with Taiwan, China, US, you know, I think all of you are in the, in this class and, um, you know, it, it could not have been better uh, if you are, if you are trained in this field because the potential for India is humongous in this area and specifically in analog mixed signal RF circuits area, you, you will benefit a lot by whatever you have learned in the class and you will be part of the like very important talent pool for India, okay. Now, um, what I would tell you is that first part what I am going to show you is how a professional design is done in industry, okay. So, let us say you choose to work for Qualcomm, Samsung, Aura or Max Linear, you know all sorts of companies, right. How does, how is the design done, okay. So, I am going to show you both aspects of it. Just peek into it a little bit and you know so that whatever you have done, you just, we kind of dropped you in the swimming pool and you know, we were giving you instructions ki aise hat maro, aise hat maro and some of you went down and came back up because of disk usage and everything, right. So, here I am going to show you what is the final product. Let us say you choose to uh, get into this field. So, I think it will be good idea for you to know, you know, what, what you would be doing because it is really exciting stuff and you will learn every step of the way, every new design you will learn lot of new things, okay. It is not like you are repeating the same thing over and over again. Every design you will learn a lot of things and there are a lot of nuances, okay. So, first thing that is what I am going to show you. Second part I am going to show you is to give you a picture of a big chip that we have sent out uh, from our lab and how does the big chip look like, how many people work on it, you know, if you will be part of a team. Rarely nowadays a single person does one chip, rarely, I mean that person has to be, I know of a one person who has done this, who used to work with me at Motorola, but I mean he was considered superhuman. You know, so uh, we are all uh, mortal humans, right? So uh, I look at this as it's always a team effort. So it's important that you are a team player when it comes to chip design. That's very important. Okay, so we'll look at that. After that, by that time we will kind of reach about 45 minutes or so. We will go down, take a picture for the class. I hope you can leave everything here, okay? And we will come back and I'll give you some tips on end send. What all you have to do? How do you succeed in the end send? Okay, all right, sounds good. Okay, so the first thing we are going to talk about is an A to D converter. So, what you are seeing is let us say you decide to work on an A to D converter, you will be always preparing a final document which looks like your design document and which is kind of what you are doing when you look at project reports that you are going to submit. But this is lot more detail, project report you are just scratching the surface, okay. So, this is an A to D converter uh, design document and you know it is it's pretty elaborate and detailed. And so, first thing first, what is important? Specifications, okay. So, you will have to, you always start from specifications. So, you have to make sure what is the supply voltage, what is the input range. So, this is very important piece, okay. So, suppose wherever you are working, they tell you, okay, design an A2D converter. You will have to start with questions, you know, you have to ask all the questions which are going to impact the performance of your A2D converter, including aperture jitter. Correct? I mean, we, you remember we all learned about aperture jitter, right? So, uh, how much power dissipation, what is the conversion rate, how many number of bits, also effective number of bits is important, okay? So, all this stuff you will get and then, um, you know, the bandwidth and from that, you will probably end up preparing a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet will be more like an Excel spreadsheet where you will give allowances to each piece to, uh, like for example, your thermal noise contribution your quantization noise, your aperture jitter related noise, the phase noise of the oscillator, all those things will come into play, okay. And all of them will, will kind of add up hopefully in RMS fashion so that you will get 
uh, you know the final result. Okay, so this is what happens here, and here they have put in the put together the schematic, and then you know you know how this this is basically a workshop part document, but I just wanted to show it to you as a kind of you know, and here is the that spreadsheet I talked about. Oh, sorry, you remember I told you an Excel spreadsheet that you have to prepare, and this is that spreadsheet. So this spreadsheet basically captures you know what handles do I have as a designer, you know. Can I, uh, what is my quantization noise contribution? What is my thermal noise contribution? Each knob you have to move around to make the final result, which is effective number of bits. Okay, so that's what you're going to do using this spreadsheet. And then the final CNAD and final E knob. Okay, is that part clear? And I'll take questions at the uh, later, even after the class is over. Okay, so this is all the uh, cadence document. What are your states? What did you load? Uh, so that imagine you're not there in that company after the design is done and the chip comes back, somebody else should be look at your stuff and be able to reproduce the data or use the design that you've done for next chip, okay? So you have to be very sensitive about that in that sense, okay? You cannot do a design and not have any documentation and just leave because then they'll throw your design away. And all that effort, one year, two years that you put in is gone into garbage, literally, because it's useless to anybody without documentation, without being able to reproduce, okay? So it's very important to do all these things. Now, in this particular case, they are doing a, okay, let me show you this document first quickly. I think what are the other points I wanted to show you was, I think the last page, right? So, this last page was also critical. So, after the whole design was done, all the simulation information is put in here. And in this case, you have to make sure that you make sure your design works over process, which means all uh, different slow, slow, fast, fast, and slow, fast, fast, slow. Do you know what that means? There is a NMOS transistor and PMOS transistor and both of them can independently vary, become slow and fast. So you have to make sure all combination it works. Monte Carlo it needs to work, okay? So because you can put in, you can get an offset idea. What is the offset of your comparators, right? Because that's a practical information. You may think that everything is perfect, but when the chip comes back, you know, can you turn this off please? Whoever turned it on, yeah. So uh, uh, that is important, okay? The Monte Carlo part. And you put together all the information, make sure over temperature it works very well. That's critical. Okay. Process temperature and supply voltage. You think that supply voltage is 1.2 volts, but in reality it can vary plus minus 5%. Okay. So under all these four conditions, all three conditions, it has to work. Your chip has to meet the spec. Your design has to meet the spec. Okay. So, and plus you have to get certain amount of yield, which is, which comes from the Monte Carlo analysis. So this is kind of the final thing that you'll put together that, oh, after doing everything, this is the data that I have captured, okay? And then what does this say? My design was originally, uh, I think this was a 10-bit A2D converter. Uh, if you have a 10-bit A2D converter, then wh what is your signal-to-noise ratio expect, ideally? Approximately 60, right? 6, six, uh, six dB per uh, one bit. Exact number we can calculate, okay? All right. And then um, in this case, you can see you're not able to achieve 60, uh, 60 dB. You're actually slightly smaller, okay? And then it's about 56.52 after putting all the, um, all the impairments of your A2D converter, okay? And you get about 9.1 1 bits of enum, which is pretty good, okay? As long as you can guarantee it and predict it over process temperature and voltage variation, huh? that is important. You should be predictable. So this is kind of the way you document your piece. Okay, all right. And now let me take you through the actual design that they have done. And uh, the purpose of showing you that is, you know, how do you draw your schematics? How do you make sure that your, your information is visible to everyone? Hmm? It's a discipline, or I like to call it hygiene, design hygiene, okay, that you have to follow. So in this case, the first example I'm going to show you is done by, done by somebody else. I wouldn't do it this way, but I just wanted to show you an A2D converter example. Uh, and this is done by Cadence, right? Cadence from Cadence. So all this stuff is available if you're, um, over the summer, if some of you want to do things with us, you know, we will, we will let you play, you can do things in the lab and kind of come up with something next, you know, something cool that you want to do. But the, the basis is available for you to play with, all right? So in this case, um, this is kind of a test bench and this is a symbol of the A2D converter, okay? So, all right. So the TV screen is showing actual, you know, Linux setup. That, that you'll be using, okay? So again, you know, what you went through, all the frustration about storage, everything, you'll get over all that stuff. After a while, since I've been doing this for what, 
30 years or so, right? So all the keys, everything I can, uh, you will get there. I mean, if you, if you use it for a year uh, and if I wake you up at night and ask you some question, then you will definitely zoom in, zoom out and latch on to the right transistor that we are talking about. So that's the way, that's the level of expertise you need to get. And how many hours does it take to become proficient? 10,000 hours. If you want to be in the top 1% designers in the world, 10,000 hours, if you put into the, your design, you'll be there. Okay, this is something from Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know if you know, uh, know his book, right? Okay, all right. So that's kind of the motivation I'm keeping in front of you. So this is our A to D converter. Here it's the simplest. Um, you can see there is a reference P, reference N, there is a common mode voltage, and this is uh, bits coming out, okay? And this is some internal uh, node voltages, is it? Out P, out N. And, uh, and you have V input and uh, differential input going in. This is our clock, right? clock going in, okay? Let's dig in here and let's see um, what's going on. And you will be telling me what kind of A to D converter this is, right? So, so what you have here is, uh, like you can, I'm gonna walk through some schematics. So this is our clock generator and I will quickly zip through it. What does this look like? It's a non-overlapping clock generator, okay? So if you are interested, we can, um, you know, you can look at some of the lecture notes and basically you have a, uh, you have a clock, uh, you feed in one clock and then using this digital circuit, you can generate a non-overlapping clock. So this is something that we do in SwitchCap. How do you generate non-overlapping clocks that we have done, okay? And then um, go out and then, um, and you are going to tell me what this looks like. This is huh? comparator, okay? So let's look into this comparator and you're going to tell me Okay, now you tell me what this is. Good, na? so I have taken you to that stage, which is exactly what my point was. Okay, as soon as I show you a schematic, you should know what this circuit is. Now you know everything about that circuit. Okay, maybe you will be off a little bit here. Sometimes there will be double tail latch. Sometimes there will be some small modifications. All right, you feel good about this? Like instantly you are able to recognize how many transistors are there, right? So many transistors are there and you are able to uh, that pattern recognition, you guys have gotten it, okay? I mean, very few people can do this, by the way. Just by looking at the schematic, within 30 seconds, they are able to recall what circuit it is. And all of you are able to do that from the hearing, so which is great, okay? So if um, if you want to figure out how to do this, then, you know, on the bottom, you looks like a diff pair, okay? And then the bottom current source has a clock going in, okay? So this is a dynamic latch, okay? So there is no static current going in. That's what we you remember, right? We talked about and then on top here is a latch circuit, you can see. This is like two inverters back to back, all right? And then these other transistors, one which are getting highlighted, they are, what is the set, each voltage set at when before you the latch kicks in, all right? So this is really good. I'm really happy that all of you recognize this. Circuit. Of course, there are so many hierarchies because uh, it makes your design clean and simple uh, to recognize, okay? That's what people do many times. And then uh, this is basically, okay, so this is an interesting part, right? If you go in here and then you can see, okay, if you go here, you will see it's a Verilog code, okay? So it's a digital circuit, so it's implemented using a Verilog code. So if you have taken digital classes, you will be able to figure out, key, you know, how do you write a Verilog code? So, you know, has, are you exposed to Verilog? How many are? Most of you, um, and it's not, it's, it's almost like writing a computer code, right? Basically C language type of thing, a little bit different, very specific for, uh, for uh, our circuit design. Uh, and it's an event driven simulation, that's what is happening there, right? So you can do that and uh, your digital piece becomes very easy in that sense. You just write a code and it pops out schematic and you plug it in, you get a layout also if you want to, okay? So that's the control logic. So we had one comparator and here, what are we seeing here? Okay, let's look at this piece. What does this look like? It's a little bit of a complicated way of showing a bunch of transmission gates, switches. You remember that the switches, and there is a capacitor here on the bottom, do you see? Okay. And then what do you see here? This is how many units of capacitor? 16 units. And then on that side you see 8 units and then you see four units. Are you able to see what I'm saying? Do you know how to recognize this? You look at this part here. Okay, okay let me show the magnified. Do you see here zero to 15? So zero to 15 is 16 units, and it's a bus type of notification, okay? So then next one is eight units, 
and the next one is four units, and then there is a two units and one units. So what what is your guess then? Hey, sir, to aage chala gaya. Pehle kya hai? Binary hai. Ah, there is a binary weighted capacitors are there. And then if you remember, there was some there was one place we had talked about putting a series capacitor. Do you remember why did we use a series capacitor? Because we wanted to reduce the number of unit capacitors. Otherwise, what happens is if you have a 10 bit converter, you need how many capacitors? There is so many of them, right? Uh, so instead of that, you put a series capacitor, then with that series capacitor, you can reduce the total unit capacitor. So that's what is going on here. And then the then the thing starts again here. If you see here, then 16, uh, 7, 8, and 4, and uh, 2, and 1, etc. Okay, so this is basically a cap bank, which is being used. So one comparator and so many caps, and so obvious conclusion, what kind of A2D converter is this? You just said it. Sare, successive approximation A2D converter. And of course, you know, the clue is right here. It says SAR control logic, right? So it's a successive approximation register, uh, you know, A2D converter. All good with this? Okay, so now we will move on to, any questions on what I have shown you so far? You understood the uh, the part about how you simulate and how do you get the specs from your circuits, right? All good. Any questions? Anything you want me to dig in specifically here? Okay. All right. So now can we go to? So this is like an IP block that you will be designing. Uh, let's say you uh, you are part of a big team, right? And now what I'm going to show you. So this is our latest chip that our team has uh, just received about what three four days ago and it's it's i will not say anything else it's being tested in the lab okay so the smile can tell something but we are not supposed to say anything until everything is checked out in the thing so so the this this chip is called dhruva pro okay so we had first chip we had sent out was called dhruva and this is a dhruva pro pro means it's a little bit advanced version, like the final version that we are doing, okay. So what is this chip supposed to do? The purpose of showing this chip is, how does a big chip look like, you know, so that you, you feel like, you know, whenever, wherever, whichever company you are joining, and if you are part of a big design team, then you kind of have already have a picture of how this, where, where do you fit in? That's what I'm trying to tell you. So for example, this particular chip has about, I think what, 12 designers working on it, 12 to 15 designers. Right, and you know, and these are all students which are trained in our lab. So when they started, they had uh, no exposure to analog design. So from there, they are able to send out a chip uh, that works first time, and it's like a production worthy chip, which means under process temperature, voltage variations, it will work. Okay, right. so this chip is supposed to take a signal, sniff a signal from the satellites, which are what hundred how many kilometers away from? I forgot now the number. Uh, 10,000 kilometers away from the earth and they are sending these signals uh, and we are we are listening to those signals and we are amplifying those signals okay and the amount of amplification that we are doing it's approximately 100,000 to 400,000 something like that 60 to 60 uh, 100 dB type of uh, sorry 100 dB 100 to 160 dB or something like that if I remember correctly, yeah. So we are amplifying the signal by that much amount, okay? And uh, so I'm gonna walk you through what really happens. So the, you sniff a weak RF signal. Um, let's take a number, right? Let's take, a, let's say the amplification is 100 dB. 100 dB is one lakh or 100,000, okay? And then, so if I have a 10 microvolt signal, what will you get at the output? 10 microvolts that is being received from the satellite what what will multiply that by 100,000? Huh? One volt, okay. So you can see how much amplification is done and that one volt signal that we get, okay, it's all differential peak to peak what we are talking about and that will, you will use an A2D converter to, to measure, convert it to bits, okay. Now, so I'm going to walk you through that entire path on a chip, okay. And so what you see outside perimeter here, okay. These are called pads, okay? So they are like tires of your chip, okay? You know what tires are, right? When you drive a car, there are tires. So tires is where we call it rubber meets the road. So pads is where you interface with the outside world. So it's a critical, I'm just telling you that it's a critical aspect of design, okay? So if you have to design pads, you know, take it very seriously because you can determine the chip's performance. Hmm? So you have to work, worry about ESD protection, 
uh, and you know you have multiple supplies coming into the chip whichever one comes up first the chip should not blow up okay um, because you are trying to create a chip which can be just given to anybody to test and if they make a mistake and they blow up your chip you don't want to replace their equipment you remember that example i had given you right if the if your chip consistently fails in a television then you are not responsible for that one dollar chip you are responsible for the whole television that you have to pay for as a company okay so that fear has to be in you that making sure that everything works okay all right so this is what the pads look like and i'm going to show you on layout also what it looks like and here we start at the input and uh, this is called low noise amplifier okay so whenever the the signal comes from the antenna you first go through low noise amplifier so what low noise amplifier is doing is that it's it's amplifying the signal but not contributing its own noise because each transistor will have its own thermal noise flicker noise and if that comes into play then you will not be able to amplify the signal so that's why it's called low noise amplifier and then there is a cross sign multiplier it's called mixer so what does mixer do the incoming signal is coming in in gigahertz range so we want to down convert that signal using a mixer topology to low frequency signals so that you can do an a to d converter operation at a very low frequency why low frequency why not capture everything at gigahertz what will happen power dissipation and it's also harder right because you will spend a lot of power if you're if you're doing something but you know the information content is very small it's a very small bandwidth right so um, uh, you know your nyquist theory you only need that much minimum sampling rate that you need right so that's what we have to do so this is our output of the mixer that goes into a complex uh, bandpass filter so you filter out everything all the noise outside all right and then you go into a variable gain amplifier so this is a variable gain amplifier so you can see and pay attention to how these symbols are drawn okay do you see what i'm say, what i'm trying to say have you looked at your own symbols do you think anybody can tell what's inside your symbol just by looking at the symbol you cannot so here we spend a lot of time so it's like a military discipline that you have to follow you know when you create schematics uh, because just by looking at it you should be able to tell ki what's going on inside you know just by looking at the symbol so in this particular case i'll take you to give an example to you and how the discipline is followed right on the top you have what do you see here these are currents coming in hmm. in microamps and it's all listed out in the node names so labeling nodes is very important because just by looking at it what can i tell this is a vga i channel 30 microamps of current going in there okay and there is a q channel 30 microamps of current is there is that clear okay and then on the right side what do you see there is a vddds and ground and substrate connection for that particular block so that's the discipline you have to follow you have to say that oh, top these are the symbols i'm going to label on bottom i'm going to label it certain way and typically the the inputs and outputs are left and right okay and you can see just by looking at the symbol 6 db vga 6 db vga and 1 db vga those are the steps each guy is providing so you can get almost 100 db overall gain in this particular one okay and then the outputs uh, are also i and q outputs of the vga coming in here right okay and then there is something very important test output okay without the test output your chip is totally worthless huh? i mean basically what will happen is that there'll be some error somewhere in your chip and you will not be able to tell where the error is because you are putting in hundreds and 400000 transistors on a chip and you don't know where the error is huh? if you if you leave something out so it's important to have a test test output so you can trace the signal like as if you are putting an oscilloscope probe at each point to figure out if there is a problem so there is a methodology you have to come up with so that you can test the entire chip each and every node in your chip not each and every node but most important nodes without loading that node because under normal operations that should not get disturbed right if you put a uh, you know bring out every node to the to the pad then it will be bad right so that's something that's an art that you have to develop over time and then the last thing is what you learn in this class okay in this particular case what is this block 3 bit a to d converter so we amplified the signal which is coming from the satellite by almost 100 db um, 100000 times and now we are converting it to a digital so let's dig in here and see what what that is like this a to d converter all right so you see there is a adc core okay and here is will go inside the a to d converter and you can see how labeled nicely labeled and you know 
um, top and bottom digital connections on one side, programmability on one side, test part on one side. Okay. So this is now look at this part. Well, we will we will look at that a little bit later. First, we will see this part. As soon as you read the name, what do you see? What is AT? Any guesses? It's the name of the person who designed it. So if somebody something goes wrong, we know who to catch, right? That's always the the rule of the game that you will put your name. Uh, initials like I mean all my designs used to be called RZ so that um, you know people know who to blame if something doesn't work right? you know uh, I mean that's what we take pride in right if you you, you claim your uh, your circuit works or if it doesn't work you should be able to defend your circuit why it doesn't work and you have to fix it so in this case is Amitesh Amitesh Tripathi right yeah so he he's a he's in ISRO right now DRDO person yeah. so he was my student here and then this is what kind of converter is it Flash A to D converter and it's a 3 bit A to D converter, okay, and for Navic, okay. So, um, so here you can go in and what do you see here? It's a flash converter, so you need comparators. So, these are all comparators right here, okay. Let's look at one comparator and it's a differential comparator, okay. Now, what kind of comparator is this? Let's see uh, if you can tell. First of all, there are two circuits, so it gives you some clue. Huh? What does what clue does that give you? I think it's a double tail, right? If I remember, it's a, I mean you remember double tail uh, comparator that we looked at, strong arm double tail. So that's what it is. And it's a little bit modified by us uh, to take care of one um, really in, very inventive solution uh, that he has put in there uh, to cut down the power dispersion. Okay, so basically your input comes in, and then there's a your there is a differential input signal which is being compared against differential reference signal, okay. So there is a reference ladder which I am going to show you and so the output of this is basically uh, going out and all these things are cool innovations that he has added, okay, which basically compensate for any switching noise. If there is any switching noise and he puts out dummy capacitors and he, he moves them around, so any dynamic switching noise is also cancelled, okay. All right. So it will be difficult to explain each and every piece but uh, I am just giving you a very, very high level view, okay. And then here you can see these are the reference voltages, okay. These are all uh, coming from a reference and let's see where they are coming from, control E. So you can see the middle is the reference ladder. So the two IQ uh, parts are top and bottom and in the middle you have a reference ladder. So here we can go in and, okay. So there is a current programmability. That's another thing you need to know is when you design a circuit, you know, don't look at the numbers as the final word that oh this is what I learned this is what the number has to be you have to assume that you have made a mistake somewhere you start with being humble let's say that whatever I'm doing I'm doing making some mistake somewhere so when you make a mistake what do you do you want to be able to change things when the chip comes back because once the chip comes back no one can help you and God cannot help you okay because it's all all casted uh, everything is casted in in the chip in silicon right so what you do is you want to make sure that Everything that I'm doing, can I make it programmable? Because digital is free. Right? You have all the digital uh, programmability to your uh, to your health. In this particular case, how many bits do we have? I think 256 bits for programming. Something if, much more than that. Maybe 512 bits to control this chip, to put it into different different modes. You know, because I have set that fear into every designer that if you just have one current going into your thing, it's not going to work. So you should be able to change the current in steps of 10%. You know, there should be four or five settings, so I can change things. And then you can look at it, even if the chip has some bad processing, you know, I can recover from that. Okay, so that's the habit that you have to put in. What's the first habit? Testing. And the second habit is keeping everything controllable. So in this case, we are controlling the amount of current going through each resistor. And what will that do if I increase or decrease the current? My comparator thresholds will expand or reduce. Do you understand that? Like IR drop, right? So I'm shoving current through a resistive ladder and if I change the current in certain steps, which is what you on the top here. So there is a current mirror here and that current mirror is controlling the current in this, you know, in steps of 5 microamps or so. And then you're changing that. So with that, I can change the, you can see here, it's nicely documented, okay? Do you see that? So current is off when all settings are one and these are all the digital programming settings that, that he has provided. So I can change the current in these steps, so I can, like an accordion, I can change the, the reference voltages. Huh? Once the chip comes back, I can play and I can see which, where it works best. Okay. 
So simulation is there to take you to some level, okay? But then once the chip comes back, simulation can only help you debug, okay? But if you leave programmability in there, then you come out, you know, really ahead, okay? And I can't stress enough importance of programmability. Okay, so this is programmability and then the A2D convert, uh, converter output will then, uh, then kind of go outside the chip, okay? So that's pretty much this is. The two other things I wanted to show you is SJ, your TA, Shubham, is he here? I think he is out. So that's his design. It's a, it's a master bias. Master bias means it provides bias to the entire chip. And on the, on the right side, do you see so many blocks and each block gets certain amount of current. And it's all listed, 10 microamp, 10 microamp, 30 microamp, 30 microamp, all those kind of things. So it's important to list those out. And then this current is getting transported over the entire chip, all right? And then if you go inside, uh, I'll quickly take you to the, okay. Now you're going to tell me what this circuit looks like. Have we, have we done this? I don't know if we have done this in this class. There is a bipolar transistor here. And then any guesses on what this circuit is? Have you learned something called band gap circuits? No? 618? Okay, anyway. So what this does is um, you, you are con creating a sub voltage or a current which is either proportional to absolute temperature or which is fixed no matter what supply voltage changes. Because if the supply voltage changes and if you just use a resistive ladder, then the, that voltage will also change by that percentage. So you, you use something called band gap, which is like, you know, ultimate 1.2 volts, doesn't matter which chip you go to and it's based on silicon band gap, okay? All right, so this is one circuit that you can do. And in that circuit we use, um, if you remember, we talked about transistor matching, which I'm gonna show you. Okay, so here we need 1 is to 8 transistor matching. So when you want to do 1 is to 8, what do you think you'll do? 1 plus 8 equal to? Huh? 9, na? So 9 mean you can do 3 by 3 uh, array. And then the, the for matching, you would put 1x device in the center and rest of the guys are around, right? So that you can get a very good matching. So for example, here you can see, this is the way the layout is. And what is D by the way? Huh? Dummy, they're not doing anything. They're just occupying most of the area, but we are just making sure that all the A's and all the B's uh, look alike, okay? So that's the amount of effort that you have to put in to make sure that things match very well, all right? Okay. Now, so this is basically uh, where, how the current is transported to the rest of the blocks. Okay. But I think there is one more thing I want to show you here. And what you see here is something called a PLL. I, that's the designer is sitting right here and do you see his initials there, right? AJK. Okay, that's his his baby. And uh, so this is a phase lock loop. Hmm? So you get 26 megahertz. From 26 megahertz, I can generate up to 5 gigahertz maximum. Before the divider is 5 gigahertz. Before, yeah, about 5 gigahertz. So that's such a scaling that you get. And it has to be very accurate. It's a PPM, parts per million type of accuracy that we have to get, okay? So this is the, the circuit that he has designed and it's all controllable. So for example, if you, if you look at the bands of signals that you can receive, right? For, for, you, uh, for India's NAVIC, we are sniffing 1.2 and 1.2 uh, and 2.5. These two, the signals are in that band, okay? And then US, it's 1.1 and 1.5 gigahertz signal okay so what we have done is with with ajinkya's block we can we can control the the local oscillator frequency to any of those bands so we can control it to reach all the worldwide satellite signals that's what we decided to do and it works beautifully so and here is something that what does this signify delta sigma or if you had to argue it's sigma delta right so there is a sigma delta converter here which will make sure that you know, um, the, the this final tone which is coming out doesn't have any, it, it accurately resolves without having any spurs. All right, so this is what it is. And other thing I wanted to show you was here is this piece. See, we talked about about uh, half a K of controllability, right? So this is called SPI, Serial Programming Interface. So outside chip, there is a, there is a uh, programming interface and then um, then you, you kind of control all the, uh, all the bits, you know, in all the different types, of, like, okay, I want to go in LNA and change the current by 10%. Uh, 
I want to increase it by 10%, reduce it by 10%, I want to change this resistor by 15%. All those things are here. With each bit, I can do all that control. So there's a whole bunch of software that we have to design to make sure that all these raw controllability is, is kind of con taken care of. And that's exactly what happens when you're operating your phone. Okay? All this stuff is at a lower level to control the chip. Uh, and it's, it's all, uh, you know, there are some firmware files which are, which are loaded in. So whatever you do, it's kind of, you know, brick by brick, layer by layer. It's, it's going into design of a big scheme. Okay, that's kind of what I wanted to give you a feel for. And here, if you go in, I don't think we can see anything. It's, a, it's, like, a, it's like a mud, you know, so many transistors that you cannot tell what's going on. Okay, so now I'm showing you the layout. So this is the final product that you will develop, right? So isn't that cool? Uh, on one side, you show the schematic and uh, on the right side, you're seeing the actual layout of the chip, okay, which will be sent out for fabrication. And I don't think we have a die photo to show. Right? I wish I had a die photo so that you could have you could have seen the die photo. So this structure, my favorite structure, this jalebi structure, right? That is an inductor. Yeah, it's a, one of the most important. Um, you there is one thing you can get out of this class is there are two pieces you have to pay respect to. One is inductor and second one is huh? crystal oscillator. Very good. Huh? As my students, you have to always thank crystal oscillator and inductor because they are the ones who are uh, you know very important and often neglected huh, warriors in our uh, path to whatever we have, right? So this is an inductor and you can see these are a whole bunch of capacitors that, and this is designed by Vijay uh, and he's, he's very, very methodical, you know, in making sure, basically as an RF designer, you have to be ultimately methodical, you know, and in counting every little thing that you're putting in your design. Otherwise, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, the circuit doesn't work to perfection and so this is the RF front end part that, that we design okay and then um, then it goes into I think there is a mixer yeah this is the mixer and then on the right side you have you see lots of capacitors okay so lots of capacitors and resistors that's RC filter uh, signify uh, and then you know all those uh, basically pole zeros in that filter they are all programmable and this is something why my student um, Shweta design, uh, Shweta Jose, right, and, uh, and and she's also very good. And this is like something unique. What she did was a lot of programmability, controlling the uh, the filter performance um, over a wide variety of bandwidth, almost an order of magnitude. So you know it worked really well. And um, the next thing I wanted to show you is something that Jeffin designed. This is a variable gain amplifier, and you can see how the layouts look like. You know, they're very symmetrical. There is one thing you will notice is perfect symmetry, okay, because there is a differential signal coming in and you have to have laid down everything in a perfect symmetry. So that's what he has done. And even the signal paths, if you see here, right, they are all nicely symmetrically laid out. So the coupling is also identical in each path, okay, that you can see. Um, and then that is the variable gain amplifier and the variable gain amplifier output goes to, is the, is the A2D converter here, if I remember? Yeah. ADC IQ, that's what it is. So this is the A2D converter, you know, again, you know, uh, all the resistive ladder, it's, it's a whole bunch of test circuits here, okay. And then I wanted to show you two things. One is a band gap circuit, which I think is here. This is the band gap circuit, huh? No, this is LNA. And this is the, the circuit. You remember we talked about matching? Okay, so the inside bipolar transistor is right here and outside ones are here and the rest one, rest of them ones are dummies to make sure that they match very well. Okay. So uh, that's the band gap circuit uh, and then uh, one of the most important pieces of the puzzle is this. So if you're a digital designer, that's what you would be doing. Okay. So you write a code and then it pops this out. Okay. And then you make sure you run through a lot of checks, you learn how to do verification. And um, with that, uh, basically, this will program the entire chip. So we use digital extensively in this case. All right. So we are pretty much done here. Any questions, I'll take. And this part here on the uh, on the on the top right here is our uh, voltage control oscillator VCO, which is operating at almost five point some gig, uh, six gig, six gig, right? Six gigahertz. Um, so we start with twenty six megahertz, and this one operates at six gigahertz. And we are able to control that frequency with a resolution of maybe less than a kilohertz or few hundred hertz if I remember. So you, you can move that frequency by so much by digital programming. Because if you move by so much, then you are off, off the channel. 
All right, I'll stop right here. I'll take some questions on whatever I have shown you so far. Any questions? Was this cool? Not cool? Okay. I hope this gives you an insight into life of an IC designer. And doesn't matter what kind of IC designer you are, digital, analog, but this is what you'll be breathing, um, you know, in any company you go. And you will be starting off from a small block and as you get better and better and better, then you will get more responsibility. And the ultimate responsibility will be, once you understand all the blocks, then, then you will get a leadership role, where you, you have a whole bunch of new guys or girls coming, and they will design, and you will be guiding them, okay, this is, uh, so as a, as a lead designer, your job is to make sure all the moving parts are moving all in the right direction, that's it. It shouldn't be that one moving part is going in the wrong direction, um, and final uh, chip has to be production worthy. That is important. All right. Any questions? No questions? Uh, we're going to take a class picture with the TAs and everything. And then, then we will um, we'll come back and resume the end same part. Okay. All right.